Good afternoon. My name is Dr. Sharon Parrish. I'm a professor of medicine and clinical psychiatry and a professor of clinical medicine at the Weill Cornell Medical College in New York City. It's my pleasure to be speaking to you today about female sexual dysfunction. Let's talk about it, a success story where I'm going to share a case and some background information and uh, treatment issues regarding um, the patient that I'm going to be discussing. So as I mentioned, I'm going to start with a case. This is a premenopausal woman with hypoactive sexual desire disorder. Um, the name I'm going to use for her is Jennifer. That's not her real name. She's 41, and she seeks treatment with me for distressing low desire that she's experienced for over five years. The characteristics of her problem, similar to many of my patients with this condition, are low initiation or no initiation of sexual, in sexual activity. Frequency has actually been once monthly or less when she consents to the uh, request of her partner. The motivation for having sex is not her endogenous sex drive, but rather, again, responding to the request of her husband, Jeffrey, who is uh, 46 years old and has normal sexual function. She rarely masturbates, but when she does engage in either masturbation or, or sexual activity with her husband, she has normal arousal and orgasm phase and does not have sexual pain. The couple, because of this problem, has actually sought um, couples psychotherapy as well as she's also sought individual counseling. And neither, although they weren't specifically directed as, se directed as sex therapy, have improved their sex life. The marriage described as Jennifer is solid and supportive. There's no sexual abuse. Uh, a little bit more about Jennifer. She drinks alcohol, so what she calls socially, which consists of having one or two glasses of wine three to four nights a week, usually in the context of work-related social events, and she considers alcohol sort of part of her job. She was on oral contraceptive pills since the age of 16, and she dis remember she's now well, you know, well been using them for quite a number of years, but she discontinued them three years ago due to a low sex drive. And she's had normal menstrual periods since then. A gynecologist had suggested to her that might improve her sex drive. She's had intermittent depression since the age of 18 and has been using, using serotonin reuptake inhibitors for treatment, although currently she's on an SNRI, uh, venlafaxine, 75 milligrams, which she's been taking daily for the past three years since she stopped the birth control pills. She's not feeling depressed, but hasn't seen an improvement on uh, this treatment for depression um, and doesn't feel like she's had treatment emergent sexual dysfunction from the SNRI, and she hasn't seen an improvement off the birth control pills. Her physical exam, her general exam, and her pelvic exam are normal. Some of the traditional lab tests that I check when I'm seeing a patient with low desire were fine. She had a normal thyroid and normal prolactin. Her free T4 was normal, so thyroid function again is normal. She was concerned about having a slightly low testosterone, which a gynecologist had told her uh, in the past was slightly low, and I repeated this testing, um, and I did something, performed something called a calculated free testosterone, which was slightly below the normal range for a premenopausal woman, um, and this calculator accounts for the woman's own sex hormone binding globulin, which is often increased in women on birth control pills and sometimes is sustained a little bit high after they're discontinued. And that carrier protein can tie up some of the testosterone. So we wanted to see what her level was, and it was just slightly low. So in thinking about my treatment strategy for Jennifer, I had four possibilities in mind. One was to refer her back to a therapist, although this time to a sex therapist who would focus more specifically on the sexual complaint that the patient had that is discrepant low sexual desire or distressing low sexual desire. Other therapies that have been found to be useful for HSDD are cognitive behavioral therapy and mindfulness uh, therapy, but the, the patient really preferred a medication treatment. Uh, another option is to use off-label bupropion as an adjunct to her current S SNRI, although the data on this is relatively, uh, relatively weak. The patient asked about off-label testosterone, and I moved her away from this, uh, and we'll, if, we'll talk a little bit more about this later, but primarily because she was premenopausal, and most importantly because we had an FDA treatment approved for, for her that I thought was going to be more effective. So we've been discussing hypoactive sexual desire disorder, and I'd just like to review the definition. 
According to the DSM-4, which is the psychiatric compendium which describes sexual disorders, and the International Consultation for Sexual Medicine, as well as the International Society for Sexual Medicine, HSDD is described or defined as a persistent or recurrent deficiency or absence of sexual thoughts and fantasies or desire for sexual activity. As with Jennifer, it can cause marked distress or interpersonal difficulties. And we have to make sure it's not due to another primary disorder, one of her medications, such as the birth control pills, or due to depression, um, which in her case we did not feel was the case because the depression was treated. The patient has the characteristic of lack of motivation for sexual activity with reduced or absent fantasies or spontaneous desire or thoughts about sexual, sexual activity. She also had reduced or absent responsive desire to erotic cues and stimulation or the inability to maintain desire throughout interest, desire interest throughout her sexual activity. Um, these, all of her characteristics were quite consistent with the current definition. Patients often will have avoidance, which is not due to pain or anorgasmia when they're afflicted with this problem. Important to both the DSM-4 and its next iteration, the DSM-5, in order to be diagnosed with HSDD that warrants a psychopharmacologic, inter psychopharmacologic intervention, um, the problem must be generalized, meaning it's not limited to certain types of stimulation situations or partners, rather than being situational, in which case it's limited to certain types of stimulation situations or partners. And in that case, we might address those issues rather than prescribing more generalized treatment. The problem has to cause distress and persistence, as I mentioned. It has to have some duration or frequency, six months or more than 75% of encounters, and that's clearly the case here. And the problem has to be moderate or severe as self-rated by the patient in order to warrant a therapeutic intervention. The etiology of HSDD is understood to be an imbalance between excitation and inhibition. And the excitatory hormones in the brain that are uh, involved with desire are listed on the left-hand side. And the excitatory psychosocial interpersonal, interpersonal factors are also listed. And we can also see on the right-hand side the inhibitory hor uh, brain hormones or physiologic factors and the inhibitory psychosocial factors, things like relationship conflict, stress, negative beliefs about sex, or prior experience. Understanding neurotransmitters and central regulation of desire and arousal is, arousal is critical to the treatment of HSDD. As you can see from this somewhat complex schema, and we'll, we'll show you a little more detail, dopamine is at the center of sexual excitement and leads to improved desire, whereas serotonin can be inhibitory. Also excitatory are testosterone and also inhibit and norepinephrine, and also inhibitory are prolactin. So in this patient, um, one has to look at, is there a psychopharmacologic intervention that can change this balance between the inhibitory effects of serotonin and the excitatory effects of dopamine, as well as the excitatory effects of norepinephrine. So in thinking about Jennifer, um, who's a 41-year-old woman, we can look at the prevalence rate of distressing low sexual desire or HSDD, and as you can see, um, here, Jennifer is she's in her 40s, um, early 40s, and this red line here is the prevalence rate in a large population study of distressing low sexual desire. And Jennifer fits in right here. About 10% of the population of women that were studied in this large population study were afflicted with HS, were afflicted with distressing low sexual desire or HSDD. When we're looking at patients in the clinic, there are uh, instruments or screening instruments available to diagnose HSDD. You'll see on this slide the decreased sexual desire screener, which is a validated screening and assessment questionnaire for HSDD. And the patient completes this on her own. And in Jennifer's case, she answered question one, one through four with the answer of yes. She had in the past a level of sexual desire or interest that was good or satisfying prior to the onset five years ago. There's been a decrease in her sexual desire or interest. She's bothered by the decreased level and would like to see the level of sexual desire or desire, interest increase. And in her view, although she had some of these conditions in question five, depression, um, she was taking some medications she had questions about, um, she, she felt that all of, any of those factors were really not the cause of her HSDD, that it was really something that was independent, and she thought it needed independent assessment or treatment. 
There is another questionnaire available called the Female Sexual Function Index. And this is a validated questionnaire that was developed and validated as a brief report measure of female sexual arousal and the other domains of sexual function. And this is a full scale of 19 questions that assesses six domains of the patient's recall over the past four weeks. There are two desire questions which can also be looked at independently. Female sexual dysfunction is scored in total, looking at all the different domains, and a score of less than 26.5 uh, characterizes the patient as having female sexual dysfunction. Um, this questionnaire can be found at the link uh, noted here on the slide, right here, the FSFI question, questionnaire.com. And it may be a helpful adjunct to assess other domains of sexual function, even if you're using the decreased sexual desire screener. HSDD has many different causes. Um, this is a list that is very comprehensive and you can study it, but it lists the medical and psychiatric conditions, the medications, substances of abuse, the psychosocial factors, and the sexual factors that may be associated with HSDD. And it's up to the clinician to look and identify the potential factors, and I highlighted those here in red, depression, antidepressants, oral contraceptives, mood disorder and determine if those are the more primary problem or although those have coexisted or coexist in this patient, they're not really the cause and the ASHDD re requires independent uh, assessment and treatment as I felt was the case in this patient. Um, the International Society for Sexual Medicine has a process of care for hypoactive sexual desire in press. And this is the algorithm here, and I want to identify how this algorithm can be helpful in the management of this patient. So you can see here the patient we spoke with her, she described low sexual interest or desire. Um, we felt, based on the DSDS and her report, that it was generalized, it was acquired. Um, we looked at all the biopsychosocial factors and decided that all the modifiable biopsychosocial factors had been addressed. The patient had already been to counseling, and she had HSDD without any remaining factors. She was premenopausal, and the options, again, could be sex therapy or central agents. And if you remember from my earlier slide in thinking through the potential options, we were thinking about pharmacotherapy for this patient, and that's what we'll be discussing. So the patient elected to uh, undergo a trial of flibanserin. Flibanserin is classified as a multifunctional serotonin agonist antagonist, or an MSSA. And its effect is a mixed postsynaptic 5-HT1A agonist and a 5-HT2A antagonist. Um, and these uh, mixed effects may have pro-sexual effects ultimately on the patient. If you remember back on the brain chemistry slide, we want to improve activity at the dopamine receptors and decrease the serotonergic effects such that region-specific elevations in dopamine and norepinephrine offset the inhibitory serotonin activity. And that's what this drug does. And in, in the case of this patient, we felt that that balance was going to be helpful and may um, either offset her endogenous HSDD or complement the action of the antidepressant therapy and, and moderate her HSDD in the context of that treatment. Flibanserin is an FDA approved treatment. It's been available for over a year. Um, and it's approved for acquired generalized HSDD in premenopausal women. That's not caused by a primary other problem, as I mentioned earlier. The dose is 100 milligrams daily at bedtime. And the patient undergoes an eight-week eight -week trial to determine efficacy. There are warnings about hypotension and syncope due to the interaction of flibanserin with alcohol, which in fact is a contraindication. And that's why I mentioned in the case history about her uh, regular social drinking. The patient um, needs to be told this, and this, it needs to be discussed before writing the prescription. We should also avoid this medication in patients with liver impairment or on moderate or strong CYP3A4 inhibitors. A provider needs a certification to prescribe, and also pharmacies need the certification for dispensing. This is called the Risk Evaluation and Mitigation Strategy, or the REMS program. And I'll go into each of these different issues in a little bit of detail in the subsequent slides. Of note, flibanserin was approved by um, a num there were a number of studies, but there were three pivotal trials that were responsible for the approval of the drug at the FDA. And the endpoints were uh, the FSFI desire score. I showed you the FSFI, the Female Sexual Function Index, and there are two questions on desire. And that was very important um, in the third study as a clinical endpoint. 
Um, in the first two studies, as well as in the third study, satisfying sexual events were also endpoints that were looked at. And all of these different endpoints, the female sexual function index desire score and satisfying sexual events, were all connected to why the drug was approved, and they showed statistical efficacy in all the trials. In the clinical trials and what we see in clinical practice is there, there are some side effects that occur in about 9 to, to over 9 to 12 percent of patients. Um, if you look at the far column here, you'll see there's placebo and there's flibanser in treated patients. Dizziness, somnolence, nausea, and fatigue are the most common side effects. And this is reasonable um, and similar to what we see in uh, other CNS active drugs. Um, and the difference between placebo is common. Um, hypotension was observed in a very small number of patients taking plobanserin, that is 0.2 compared to 0.1 subjects taking placebo, and this doesn't, was not statistically different. Syncope occurred in 0.4 compared to 0.2 in these three clinical trials, again, not statistically different. And discontinuation rates were ranged between 9.6 and 13.4 percent versus lower rates per, for placebo, again, very similar to other CNS drugs. Uh, the important thing about flibanserin is to understand about the interaction uh, between flibanserin and alcohol. The FDA was concerned about this, although phase three trials not re regulating alcohol didn't show an increase in hypotension and syncope. Again, the difference between 0.4 and 0.2 for syncope. Um, however, the FDA was concerned about the interaction with alcohol and did require a dedicated alcohol study. So in a small number of subjects, uh, 25 subjects, 23 of whom were men, flibanserin 100 milligrams was combined with either two alcoholic drinks rapidly or four, the equivalent of four alcoholic drinks. And in those studies, in the two drink group, 17% required an intervention for symptomatic hypotension. And in the four drink group, uh, one uh, patient uh, was symptomatic and 25% of the subjects had orthostatic hypotension. So based on this, the FDA put out this um, statement, a black box warning, basically that flibanserin cannot be mixed with alcohol and the patient has to agree not to drink and sign a form and that's part of the risk mitigation strategy which I'll show uh, a little more detail on in a subsequent slide. Going back to the phase three trials, those three trials that I showed you which did not regulate alcohol, again, there was no difference in hypotension and syncope. And when an analysis was done uh, with flibanserin users who were also alcohol users, um, and compared to those that didn't, so flibanserin users and alcohol users were compared to flibanserin users who didn't drink, the difference in hypotension and syncope was also not statistically significant. For, high, for uh, syncope, it was 0.7 versus 0.3. So alcohol users really didn't have a statistically different rate of, hy of hypotension or syncope, even in the larger clinical trials where al alcohol was not, was not regulated. According, uh, experts really believe that safety concerns raised by, raised by the FDA, particularly hypotension and syncope, are really rare to infrequent with bedtime dosing. One thing that's important to understand about the, de the designated alcohol trial is that uh, the individuals in this trial, the 25 individuals, 23 men and two women, drank the alcohol very rapidly after taking the 100 milligrams of flibanserin. This was on an empty stomach after a light breakfast, and it was first thing in the morning. The medication is intended to be taken at night right before the patient goes to sleep to minimize any issues um, such as have been described. Now, one question that came up from my patient, and you should be asking about this patient, is what about the interaction between flibanserin and the SNRI that this patient is taking, the venlafaxine 75 milligrams a day? And what the FDA says in their briefing document about this is that in the studies, uh, the large three, uh, phase three studies that I've been discussing, flibanserin didn't um, cause any major problems. It didn't exacerbate depression and anxiety in patients taking an SNRI or SSRI. Um, the combination of flibanserin and an SSRI or SNRI did exacerbate dizziness and insomnia by a small amount, both in the phase three trials and in a small dedicated SSRI study. So what the FDA is saying, and this is how I advise my patient, is that this is a consideration and the patient should be aware of how um, she feels when she takes the medication and to be very careful to take this right before she goes to bed and to notice whether her side effects are increased. But this is not a contraindication and, and many patients did just fine. Um, and again, the side effects were limited to under 12% uh, in most patients.
Um, the patient is no longer an oral contraceptive, but one of the questions that she came up, should she uh, still, she was premenopausal, should she choose to resume her contraception, uh, would this be something that uh, she needed to be considering. So oral contraceptives are classified as weak CYP3A4 inhibitors, and if you remember from my earlier slide, only moder moderate to uh, more um, strong CYP3A4 inhibitors are contraindicated. And a meta-analysis from a phase one study showed that exposure to fulfanserin was slightly increased when co-administered with oral contraceptives. So one would need to be aware of potential increased side effects and guide the patient accordingly, but again, it's not a contraindication. Uh, the patient was currently using a different form of birth control and wasn't really considering this at this time, but she wanted to know what uh, the situation would be should she choose to change that. So to, going back to more concrete issues of phlebanserin prescribing, um, we really must advise the patient that patients have to uh, abstain from alcohol. And we as the provider, and I had to do this with my patient, Jennifer, really had to evaluate the patient's willingness to agree to do so and to follow through with this, um, with this agreement. Um, so she, she said that she was willing, and she was willing certainly for the eight-week trial that I advised her to undergo to see if she would have improvement in her HSDD on this treatment. Uh, this slide, again, summarizes the contraindications of phlebanserin, use of alcohol, or moderate or strong CYP3A4 inhibitors. While oral contraceptives are not contraindicated because they're weak CYP3A4 inhibitors, there are other drugs that are important to know about, HIV drugs, antifungals, and especially um, very, very important is fluconazole. This is something that a lot of women take for yeast infections, often antibiotics. Uh, for UTIs, uh, some patients are on the anti blood pressure meds or the anti-epileptics. So again, these are absolute contraindications and you cannot use them if you're going to uh, use these medications or use phlebanserin if they're going to stay on these drugs. Um, I want to just highlight a little bit more about the REMS program. Um, I'm already a certified prescriber. It's a pretty straightforward process, and it's very simple, but it's important to become a prescriber if you want to use phlebanserin. Um, the uh, REMS program, again, stands for Risk Evaluation and Mitigation Strategy, and the specific purpose is to mitigate the increased risk of hypotension and syncope, which I've explained to you, due to alcohol use. And in order to become a certified provider, you go to the website for the medication, www.addyrems.com. You read the information, you complete the training, and complete a short assessment. It's four questions. You fax it in in order to enroll, and you only have to do it once, and then you're a certified prescriber. And when the patient uh, comes to you and you make the decision, like I did with Jennifer, to give this medication, you um, just go ahead and prescribe. There's no paperwork involved once you've completed the training and you faxed in the form. Um, when the, the patient, when the patient does receive the prescription, she has to sign a form, which you can print from the website. I just have a stack in my office saying that she understands the risk with alcohol and that she agrees not to drink alcohol. One important thing that I emphasize with my patients is that it's an eight-week trial, and many women have had children. They've been through first trimesters of pregnancies and you know, longer times of pregnancy where they haven't drank, and they understand that this is a trial. They're going to see how it goes, and depending on how the medication helps them, you know, they may be so happy that their HSDD is treated that this doesn't really become an issue. I want to go back to another point that came up with Jennifer was, should she be, would she be a candidate for testosterone for her distressing low sexual desire? And in the next couple of slides, um, I'm going to just summarize what we understand about systemic testosterone for the treatment of low libido. And although, if you remember from the four quadrants and the four choices, that off-label treatment with testosterone is not what we chose for Jennifer, um, it's important to understand what the treatment guidelines are. So in summary, randomized placebo-controlled trials consistently show benefits of transdermal testosterone versus placebo for sexual desire, arousal, orgasm, pleasure, satisfaction, and pain. And all the subgroups for which systemic testosterone for the treatment of distressing low libido are indicated are listed here. Surgically postmenopausal women on estrogen, naturally postmenopausal women on estrogen and progesterone, postmenopausal women on no other hormone therapy, and then where does Jennifer fit in? Premenopausal women in the late reproductive years. Now, Jennifer is, not, is sort of middle. She's just over 40. She's not quite late, but she's later. Or there's been a few trials showing the efficacy 
for treatment emergent SSRI, and she's on an SNRI, antidepressant-induced sexual dysfunction. Both of these, and all of these are actually off-label treatment because there's no FDA-approved testosterone product for women. But um, there is evidence for that. But Jennifer asserted to me that her, her problem was not treatment emergent. She had the HSDD before her depression was treated, and when she was treated, the medication did not make her HSDD better or worse, although her depression improved. So neither of those really felt like a strong reason for me to use the medication in this patient. Of note, there's really no randomized controlled trial data for premenopausal women on combined oral contraceptive pills, and certainly not, uh, there's no evidence for DHEA, although that wasn't an issue here. Um, so I think that, again, where we landed with Jennifer was that we were going to give her um, Flavanserin, but I thought it was important for her to understand why we weren't choosing testosterone. Just a bit more about testosterone. So randomized placebo, double-blind placebo-controlled studies that established the efficacy for all the groups that I showed you in the last slide were really only specifically for a patch, which is not FDA-approved or available. It was only available for these research trials for relieving symptoms of HSDD and naturally and surgically uh, postmenopausal women with or without concomitant estrogen or estrogen and progesterone therapy if the woman has a uterus. The main side effects were increased hair growth and acne. Available safety data, although not conclusive, were reassuring regarding cardiovascular, breast, and endometrial outcomes. And long-term safety data demonstrated no significant impact on intermediate metabolic endpoints like lipids or blood sugar, et cetera, and a low rate of cardiovascular events in breast cancer in postmenopausal women at increased cardiovascular risk. So for Jennifer, as she transitioned into her peri or postmenopausal years, I explained to her that we would monitor or continue to follow her testosterone. And at some point, that conversation about evidence-based off-level testosterone might be reinitiated. Re but right now, I felt the best choice was to try flibanserin. I want to mention one more uh, collection of off-label treatments. One of them was on my four quadrants on my early slide about the treatment options. So there were two centrally acting agents uh, that, I, that have been studied um, as off-label non-hormonal pharmacologic therapy for HSDD. The first is bupropion. Uh, bupropion uh, here is a norepinephrine dopamine reuptake inhibitor. So we remember back to that first slide, both norepinephrine and dopamine elevations are responsible for improving sex, sex drive when you look at central neurotransmitter activity. Um, it inhibits the dopamine transporter and the norepinephrine transporter, and it's been investigated in several clinical trials for the treatment of HSDD. In small clinical trials that were done several years back, almost over a decade ago, um, Bupropion did improve sexual function, but didn't have an effect specifically on frequency. And we just didn't really feel like that was going to be the best way to go for Jennifer. Uh, Buspirone is a uh, presynaptic serotonin 5-HT1A partial agonist. And it results in a reduction of serotonin. And I remember I showed you that serotonin was inhibitory. In studies, uh, there was a post hoc analysis of add-on buspirone to SSRI for treatment of depression. Um, and some of the subjects reported an improvement in sexual function uh, compared to placebo, but again, that didn't seem like the more, most robust treatment option for Jennifer given her symptoms and the whole package of her, her, her story. I'd like to end with a summary slide talking about the key points of treating HSDD and how they relate to the treatment success for Jennifer. So as I showed you, HSDD, or distressing low sexual desire, is a prevalent condition affecting one, one in 10 women approximately. And we had the curve where Jennifer fit in. It was about that right where that one in 10 is. Um, standard uh, current non-pharmacologic care includes CBT, mindfulness, and psychotherapy, as well as office-based counseling and giving advice and guidance like in a primary care clinical setting, like I do, looking for modifiable risk factors. And so she didn't really respond to psychotherapy and the modifiable factors uh, in her relationship, et cetera, she felt they had been addressed and wasn't keen on just going right back to sex therapy. We've talked about flibanserin, which is moderately effective for premenopausal women with generalized acquired HSDD. And um, in fact, I didn't tell you what happened with Jennifer, but she did receive the treatment, and she responded with improved desire and orgasm quality and felt that not just her desire, but her whole sexual experience was better. And she didn't have increased side effects uh, with her SSRI or SNRI, although that was a consideration, as I showed you. And she's chosen to continue and continues to endorse um, not drinking alcohol. 
It's important that we remember that filmanserin must be prescribed in conjunction with the REMS, and is, as, I, as I discussed in detail, and it's contraindicated with moderate to strong CYP3A4 inhibitors. As I mentioned, Jennifer agreed initially not to drink alcohol. She signed the REMS. She was already off birth control pills, although not a contraindication. It might have exacerbated her side effects. She didn't have any worsening of her depression, and as I already mentioned, no worsening of her SNRI side effects. Testosterone, as I mentioned toward the end, is evidence-based, but it's off-label. Uh, it's effective for late reproductive and postmenopausal women with distressing low libido, but given the patient's age and her response to flibanserin, we're sticking with that right now. And with that, I'll conclude the presentation. It was my pleasure and honor to discuss this case with you and hopefully have given you some insight into the evaluation and management of HSDD. Thank you very much.